I was recently asked by my friend Will Hopkins of Peace Action to do a video on sequestration. I wasn't sure what sequestration was or what he was talking about, let alone how it related to the anti-war movement. I do know about carbon sequestration, in which carbon dioxide is pumped into the ground. An idea so simplistic and nonsensical, I'm quite certain that the coal industry's research and development team is made up of kindergartners. We could make a robot that eats CO2 and poops out cookies. We'll take that under consideration. We could put giant ice cubes in the ocean. I don't know, that sounds expensive. We could stop using coal and start using wind and solar. Come on, don't be stupid, kid. We could pump it into an underground city of mermaids. Pumping it underground. <gasps> That's perfect! But what Will was talking about is actually something different. Remember that super committee thing? You know, the team of people who were supposed to eliminate an arbitrary number of dollars from the deficit? while simultaneously keeping raising taxes back up to what they were in the 1990s completely off the table, there was an equally arbitrary provision that was part of the formation of that super committee, which stated that if this bipartisan committee of millionaires couldn't decide on what to cut from the budget, budget cuts would happen across the board. We're talking about cuts to everything. Good things like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, Pell Grants, funding for the humanities, the arts, funding for schools, funding for trains, funding for roads and bridges, funding for libraries, veterans benefits, food stamps, housing assistance, NASA, and much, much more. But it also cut money for bad things like subsidies to already profitable oil companies, subsidies for already profitable coal companies, subsidies for nuclear power, which is extremely dangerous and will never be profitable, subsidies for the prison industrial complex, and cuts it's also too, and this is how it connects to the anti-war movement, the Pentagon. The Pentagon, which gives millions of dollars every year to corporations like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, GE, and the list goes on and on, for technology that the Pentagon doesn't want or need, like jet planes that haven't been used since the start of the Cold War. And also things that maybe civilians don't want or need, like domestic surveillance drones. What's interesting is that because the Pentagon makes up a very large chunk of our federal budget, it also makes up a large chunk of the cuts. What sucks is that we're also going to be underfunding all of the good stuff that the government does. I personally would love to see cuts for things that I disagree with, and see that money f pay for things that actually benefit people. All that stuff that we supposedly don't have money for, because we spend all of that money blowing people up. But under sequestration, that doesn't happen. That's not an option. What happens is one giant cut across the board. So is sequestration a good thing or a bad thing? I actually don't know the answer to that question. I think that you'll have to decide for yourself. It really depends on your priorities as a citizen. It is, interestingly enough, very similar to an argument that Glenn Greenwald made over on Salon.com about whether or not one should support Ron Paul in the Republican primary, because of the fact that he is better on civil liberties issues than Obama, although he is disastrous on a host of other things, like infrastructure, education, pretty much anything that deals with government spending. Glenn Greenwald makes a case that, for some, civil liberties is such an important issue that they're willing to hold their nose through all the social Darwinist stuff that Ron Paul stands for. In fact, sequestration is a lot like a budget that Ron Paul would propose. Just cut everything arbitrarily. Now, an argument that a person arguing for sequestration might make w could go something like this. The United States is a homicidal force. Corporations profit while suckling the teat of government and making tools of homicide. Cutting spending to the military would force an end to the American empire and would force the United States government to bring troops home, to close the thousands of military bases in 172 countries around the world, to stop funding death merchants like GE, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, etc. With things like Social Security and Medicare are already mandated by law. So no cuts legally can be made to large sections of the budget in regards to social spending. So really no worse for the wear. And if things get really bad economically, maybe people will start rioting in the streets and demanding real economic reform. Then they'll get the social spending that they have deserved for years anyways. And a counter-argument to this person might go something like this. Economic justice is incredibly important. 45,000 people die every year from preventable illness because they can't afford medical care. 16 million children in the United States go to bed hungry at least one night of the week because they are living in poverty. The real unemployment rate is at 22% or higher. Cuts across the board would mean massive job loss, which would throw our already fragile economy into a tailspin and make things much worse. And a counter-argument to that might go something like this. Economic justice is important, but we're never going to make meaningful reform until there's massive unrest. Things will not get better until they're a lot worse. 
The reason why we have so many great social programs is because things were so bad during the Great Depression when capitalism massively failed to work, enriching the 1% of society at the expense of everything and everyone. Part of the fight for economic justice is ending funding for our imperial expeditions and redirecting that funding to human needs rather than corporate greed. In his essay, Five Dollar Chess Game, Best of Three, Zuccotti Park, David Hill writes about the situation we as Americans find ourselves in. The current position doesn't look good for me. I'm ahead in material, but all my pieces are committed to defending my king. I'm in Zugzwang. Zugzwang is a term used in chess to refer to a position where every move you have is a bad one. Once you're in Zugzwang, things like having more pieces than your opponent don't matter anymore. If you can't use them to attack, you may as well not have them at all. Often players who find themselves in Zugzwang simply resign. A growing number of people in America know what it feels like to be in Zugzwang. For some of them, their whole life has been one long Zugzwang. They can't remember ever having any good options. Without catching a lucky break, a lifetime of hard work for most people results in just that. A lifetime of hard work. For others, they maybe once thought they had it all. A good job with a pension, a nice house with a payment they could afford. Set for life. Then, in an instant, it all disappeared. House is underwater, ARM is popping on the loan, pension fund bought a bunch of mortgage-backed securities, and all that's left is utter, hopeless Zugzwang. In chess, you don't have to resign when you're in Zugzwang. You can always make a sacrifice. A sacrifice in chess is when you intentionally give up some material to your opponent. And there are two kinds of sacrifice. A straight sacrifice and a sham sacrifice. Sham sacrifice is basically a kind of hustle. Your opponent gives up material for you, but it's a trap. If you get greedy and take the piece, you lose. People often make a lot of fuss over games that involve sham sacrifices, like Bobby Fischer's Game of the Century, but there's nothing dramatic about a sham sacrifice. Once you take the bait, all uncertainty about the game disappears. The other type of sacrifice, a straight sacrifice, is when you accept a disadvantage in order to break the current position. The only way out of Zugzwang is to create a new position where you and your opponent have a different set of options, even if it means that you play from less strength. Strength, after all, is relative to the choices available to you. It is a risk, but when your other option is resignation, it hardly seems like one. So really, the question that you have to ask yourself is this. Do we fight to keep what little we have even though what little we have isn't really working? Or do we offer up a straight sacrifice? Should we throw a major piece out into the line of fire, knowing that while it puts us at a temporary disadvantage, it also can fundamentally shift the game? I don't know the answer. That's up to you.
useful to recall how isolated the US and Europe are. The non-aligned countries, which is most of the world, they have for years been vigorously supporting Iran's right to enrich uranium. Within the region, as I mentioned, the irrelevant public even strongly favors Iranian nuclear weapons. The major regional power, Turkey, voted against the latest U.S. sanctions motion in the Security Council, along with Brazil, which is the most admired country of the South, as polls show. Turkey's disobedience led to sharp censure at that point, but not for the first time. Turkey was bitterly condemned in 2003 when the government committed a major crime. It followed the will of 95% of the population and refused to take part in the U.S.-British invasion of Iraq. And uh, that demonstrated its very weak grasp of democracy, which led to <laughs> sanctions and uh, sharp censure. Same today, after the 2010 Security Council misdeed, Turkey was warned by Obama's top diplomat on European affairs, Philip Gordon, that it must demonstrate its commitment to partnership with the West, follow orders in other words. A scholar with the Council on Foreign Relations asked, how do we keep the Turks in their lane? In their lane means following orders, like good Democrats, our style Democrats. Brazil's Lula it was admonished in a New York Times headline. He was warned that his effort with Turkey to provide a solution to the uranium enrichment issue outside the framework of U.S. power is a spot on the Brazilian leader's legacy. In brief, do what we say. That's your function. It's kind of an interesting sidelight to all of this, which has been effectively suppressed. Uh, the Iran-Turkey-Brazil deal had been approved in advance by President Obama, uh, presumably on the assumption that uh, it wouldn't fail and that would provide an ideological weapon against Iran. Uh, that was revealed by the British Foreign Office, which released the letter of support for it after Brazil was censured. When the uh, effort succeeded, uh, approval quickly turned to censure, and Washington rammed through a Security Council a resolution which was so weak that China readily signed, and is now chastised for living up to the letter of the resolution, but not following Washington's unilateral directives, which go far beyond it. That's the current issue of Foreign Affairs, the main establishment of Foreign Affairs Journal. Well, while the U.S. can tolerate Turkish disobedience, though with dismay, that China is harder to ignore. So the press, New York Times, warns that uh, China's investors and traders are now filling a vacuum in Iran as businesses from many other nations, especially in Europe, pull out in fear of the United States. Uh, and in particular, it's expanding its dominant role in Iran's uh, energy industries. All of this is quite in accord with the UN resolutions, but inconsistent with the more extreme U.S. demands, which have no legal authorization other than what's granted by power. The State Department warned China that if it wants to be accepted in the international community, that's incidentally another technical term that refers to the U.S. and whoever happens to agree with it at the moment, uh, if China wants to be accepted in the international community, it must not skirt and evade international responsibilities, which are clear, namely follow U.S. orders. Uh, China, unlikely to be impressed. I suspect this led to some amusement in the Chinese foreign offices.
Is there anything left for the American people to decide other than their personal lives? Is there anything left? Let us not mistake personal freedom for civic freedom. We have a lot of personal freedom in this country. So do people in dictatorships. Not as much as we, but as long as they keep their nose out of politics, they have quite a bit of personal freedom. And so do we. For example, we can eat what we want, date who we want, marry who we want, divorce who we want, pretty much work where we want, travel where we want, have the hobbies that we want. We can turn TV sets or have the clicker, switch channels anytime we want. We can push buttons on computers and get any kind of video game we want to play with. We can download whatever songs we want. We can even get into a 4,000 pound car and go three blocks to buy chiclets if we want. <laughs> let us not mistake let us not mistake personal freedom with civic freedom. Marcus Cicero described freedom as participation in power. That's civic freedom. Civic freedom is being able to decide how our food is produced and what's put in them before they come to our dinner table. They can dis civic freedom decides how fast we want to clean the air and the water. How long we want to allow agribusiness to trample on small farmers. Civic freedom means we can decide whether or not we're going to invade countries and not let a criminal recidivist in the White House, the most multiply impeachable president in American history, decide for us with the complicity of both parties in Congress who unconstitutionally gave him the authority to decide when and how to invade Iraq. It's the Congress's constitutional obligation to declare war, not the President's. It's civic freedom that can decide how to liberate our students, how to decorporatize our universities. Civic freedom that decides that we're not going to let our, our money be controlled by credit card companies and debit card companies who can penalize us and overcharge us and retroactively surcharge us. And we can't do anything about it because they debit our money instantly. And if we complain and complain, they say, you better not complain. We're going to reduce your credit score. Your credit rating will be affected. They are stuffing us with that kind of power. They are silencing us. Civic freedom would say, we're going to control. We are going to control our money. Civic freedom would say, we're going to control what we own as a commonwealth, the public lands with all the minerals, one third of America. We're going to control the public airways which we own. We're the landlords, the radio and TV stations, or the tenants. They pay us no rent. Do you realize that? Since 1927 Radio Act, they have paid us no rent for one of the most valuable public assets in the history of the country. And we don't even have our own radio and TV stations or networks, which we could have because we own them. We could say, give us back a couple hours, drive time, time, radio, TV, prime time, drive time. We're going to charge you rent, radio and TV stations. And we're going to use some of that rent to have nice production facilities so that those young people going into journalism can actually practice it and provide us with a communication system worthy of a vigorous democratic society unburdened by the censorship of advertisements emanating from Madison Avenue. That's what civic freedom does. Civic freedom would never allow our tax dollars to discover and test new pharmaceuticals and then give them away to one or other giant drug companies under monopoly marketing agreements with no price, reasonable price provisions. Imagine a woman who wrote us in 2000. She had lost her job because she was sick with ovarian cancer at age 52. She was making $19,000 a year. And of course, she lost her health insurance. She went to a doctor for an exam. He said, it's very serious. All I can recommend is a drug taxol. And she said, how much? 
And he said, $14,000 for six treatments. Bristol Myers Squibb. Well, she wanted to know why. And we informed her that 31 million taxpayer dollars at the National Cancer Institute discovered and tested in human cl critical clinical trials, tax all. And under government policy, de de Democrat Party, Republican, doesn't matter, they have to give monopoly marketing rights to a major drug company. And they gave it to Bristol Myers Squibb. And Bristol Myers Squibb made people pay through the nose. And the profits were not shared with the National Institutes of Health. No royalties. That's what happens. With many of the drugs that are discovered with tax dollars and that the drug companies lie about in their ads is if they discovered them with their R&D, and that's why they have to charge you the highest drug prices in the world after we give them tax credits and free research and development to the clinical testing level. That's what civic freedom can stop. So when you go and you say to someone, as we all do, day after day, hello, how are you? And people tell the truth or they lie. They can be sick, okay, I'm okay, fine, how are you, fine. Why don't we revolutionize the salutations? Why don't we say to people, hello, how's your civic life? Try that with someone. Hi, how's your civic life? Watch the expression. After a while, maybe they'll start saying, robust. <laughs> maybe they'll start saying, great, how's yours? Let's exchange narratives of our civic life. 